Hi, Peter. Hi. Hope you're good. Um, thanks for taking the time to actually uh, do this with me. Um, I actually wanted to talk to you because, as usual, when there's an uprising, um, when there's riots, a large part of the media, but also some uh, leaders of organizations and, and uh, NGOs, are going to are going to condemn the violence. And by the violence, I'm not talking about the violence of the police that they will condemn anyway. I'm talking about property destruction. So we've seen pictures of, uh, you know, shops in flames. We've seen, seen pictures, we've seen footage of people sort of stealing shoes and, and TVs, etc. Um, and actually, there's this thing where people say that actually riots uh, often, and some people even say historically, have always been a gift to the, the right and the far right. And I'd really like your thought on, the, on this because you, you've written a book in 2005 called How Nonviolence Protects the State. So yeah, if you can give me your opinion on like, are riots really a gift to the right and the far right? Uh, well, first off, thanks for having me. Um, I, I think this this idea that riots are a gift to the far right, like you say, it's it's common to hear that. Uh, and I think it's just a very um, cynical, naive, and even manipulative idea for a number of reasons. Uh, to start with, uh, I mean, these police killings, they didn't start recently. They've, they've always been happening in, uh, I mean, especially in U.S. history, uh, but, but in other countries as well. Um, and the only times when we've seen real consequences have been when people riot. So, so part of this um, this belief that you know people shouldn't riot because they're just empowering the right wing is actually reflecting the the racism and the passiv uh, passivity of the institutional left. Uh, the Democratic Party in the U.S. expects to be able to hold uh, people of color and poor people hostage indefinitely, saying that they have to be patient for changes that that never come when when there aren't riots, when there aren't strong combative social movements. Uh, because the alternative will be even worse, which is is really just uh, an, an abusive position to take. Um, so, uh, as I as I indicated, this posture also uh, ignores uh, what actually causes change. Uh, the very first times that active duty police officers in the U.S. were were charged for killing unarmed black people was after folks uh, started rioting. And that was certainly the case here. Uh, you know, nothing would have happened to those police officers if, if people hadn't, hadn't started rioting. And historically, looking back, um, the, major, the major legal victories of the civil rights movement in the U.S., the, the Civil Rights Act, uh, the Civil Rights Acts of um, uh, six, crap, 63 or 64, and then the ones in 68, uh, came after uh, major large-scale large -scale rioting. Uh, so, so the perspective also reflects um, uh, a lot of the institutional racism. Uh, it's it's not that you know the 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 right wing just naturally gets stronger in these moments. It's that uh, capitalists, upper middle class people, and even you know people who think of themselves as progressive and and vote left are actually more afraid of black people rising up, afraid of poor people arming themselves and defending themselves, and they're afraid of property destruction, than they are afraid of the Ku Klux Klan, of police murders, of, of all of this racist violence. So they're the ones who actually run to the right, and then and they try to blame people who fight back for their own uh, systematic and invisibilized racism. Um, so it's it's really just a just a very hypocritical posture to say that the that this helps the right because without these struggles, uh, nothing's changing and racism just gets more entrenched and and the cops are killing people, especially people of color, uh, every day with impunity. So yeah, I mean, thanks for that. But there's, there's, that's something very what, what you said is very telling, right? Um, even though f factually and historically. You know, even like short-term history um, in France, for example, like the Gilets Jaunes, um, where um, on like you know in the streets for pretty much a year, um, hardly anything happened in terms of changes. You know, in the government, um, but then suddenly people start breaking the Arc de Triomphe and like put fire to shops and stuff. And I think what a day or two days after Macron makes radical, not I mean not radical enough, but changes 
to, to what's happening in France. But so why is that so? That I mean, you've written actually in your book, one chapter is called um, Nonviolence. No, it's not a chapter, actually. I think it's, it's in the introduction of your book. Nonviolence is maintained as an article of faith and as a key to full inclusion within the movement. And I know it for a fact because I've been involved in various movements and um, also in terms of, you know, the, the Palestine question. Every movement you feel like, let's say, on, on the first thing on their web page has to be, we are a nonviolent movement. Otherwise, mm. you, you, it doesn't work. So, so why is that so? What, what, what's, what's that about? Uh, there's a lot of things at play there. First of all, when an organization broadcasts itself as nonviolent, they are making sure that they can get funding, they can get donations, and they are uh, discouraging police violence. They're making it less likely that the police open up an investigation into them, start harassing or arresting their members. So, so from the very start, we have a carrot and a stick, which, which is held by, uh, by the ruling class. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, rich people who, who give donations or rich foundations that, that can fund NGOs. And, you know, it's, it's the police, it's the leaders of government who decide what social movements get investigated and harassed and imprisoned and what social movements get, get uh, kid gloves, get rewarded, get or just get, get ignored. So, I mean, you know, the, the extreme right across Europe in North America murders hundreds of people and they get relatively, you know, low prioritization by, um, by the police. They don't get, uh, you know, arrested uh, that much, uh, don't get as demonized in the media until they start killing journalists or politicians or, you know, killing people other than, than migrants and people of color and radicals. Um, so when they pretend that nonviolence is more effective, what they're actually saying is, is, is they're conforming to the, the very real forms of violence that those who rule and who own society exercise against us to discipline how we resist. What are the ways that um, that we resist? And and then there's also the question of uh, which I'm sure we'll get into more later. Um, false ideas of what has actually caused change in the past, which comes down to uh, the winners writing the history books, or in the case of of long drawn out repressions. Um, uh, being used against uh, social movements that have uh, a lot of casualties. You know, who's, who's ever left standing at the end gets to, uh, gets to write the history book. Yeah, actually, let's go right into it. You, you've also written that nonviolence is based on a faci uh, falsified uh, histories of struggle. Um, so I'd like you to sort of develop on this. And uh, um, because even when people talk about Gandhi, Uh, Martin Luther King, they would, they will focus only on the non-violence non aspect of their struggles, even though we know that you just have to dig a little bit deeper and you realize that they didn't only advocate for non-violence. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts about this sort of falsi falsified history. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, you know, of course, the, the movement that's happening right now, it's not the first time that there's a major popular explosion against uh, white supremacist structures in the U.S. Uh, throughout the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, black people, Latino people, indigenous people, um, and, and a certain number of uh, white people you know, uh, tried to organize a very, very powerful revolutionary movement against those structures of, of white supremacy and capitalism, because, of course, they're, they're fully interlinked. Uh, and what happened was the FBI and, uh, you know, working together with local police forces uh, murdered hundreds of like more than 100 people participating in those movements. They jailed thousands. Um, it was linked to, to structural adjustments carried out by the government that destroyed uh, black neighborhoods, that, that took out social services, uh, reduced access to health care and education, allowed those communities to be flooded with drugs, with epidemics like AIDS. Um, so, so really we're talking about thousands of people killed and imprisoned, um, and, and any influential, uh, leader in, in those movements either bought off or assassinated, uh, I mean, Malcolm X, uh, uh, Fred Hampton, um, uh, Martin Luther King, all of them, all of them killed, um, And then who's who's left from that? Uh, well, you have the ones who, you know, somehow survived while, you know, maintaining a cozy relationship with the FBI. You have a lot of the white people who survived that movement. You know, they ended up getting uh, cushy jobs in universities or at NGOs. 
And, and then, of course, you have even the ones who repressed the movement now uh, claiming to speak for it. I mean, there are plenty of um, people in the U.S. government who, you know, their opinions about those movements are on record. You know, they spoke very clearly against those movements while they were happening back in the 60s, back in the 70s. And today they'll invoke uh, Martin Luther King. Um, so it was very, very important for them, first of all, to claim that the movement was victorious. When the movement it did achieve uh, some some changes, obviously, but um, I've never once met someone who participated in that movement um, who 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 claims that it was victorious. Uh, everyone everyone I've spoken to, all of the the people from that that older generation of struggle, they're all very clear that they fought for many things. They made some small changes, uh, but they're still fighting that it, it hasn't stopped. That the fight's still going on, and I think that's an obvious position nowadays when when we see what's um, you know, what started in the streets of Minneapolis and very quickly spread everywhere else. Uh, so so the people who write the history books, they're the ones who actually killed off the movement. And they want people to believe that the movement is over, that it already won, because that way people stop struggling. And they also want people to believe that the movement uh, won through nonviolence, because that way, uh, when inevitably people start to fight again, those are the tactics that they'll use. Um, a really quick example, um, uh, to, not, to not go over time, uh, and this is something that you, you don't learn in public schools in the U.S., uh, Martin Luther King's organization, the S, uh, SELC, they carried out a completely nonviolent campaign in Albany, Georgia. It was a total failure. Uh, this idea that, that they could you know, fill up the jails through civil disobedience and force the government to, uh, to get rid of segregation laws proved to be false. The jails were bottomless. And, and they declared failure. That was 1961. Um, two years later in Birmingham, the bastion of segregation in the South, 1963, so uh, before I had the confusion, it was the 1963 Civil Rights Act, the first one. Um, they tried the same exact campaign. Why did they try the same exact campaign again? Um, I can't speak for them, but I, uh, I can definitely uh, attest to the fact that lots of these progressive white donors from New England who wanted to feel very good about themselves, they felt good about donating to, uh, to Martin Luther King's organization, to encouraging another nonviolent campaign like that. So all of these outside, these you know, nonviolent agitators, these outside organizers came into Birmingham. They organized a, a protest strategy that had already failed. But this time, local folks, especially local youth, they didn't see the dignity in getting beaten up again by racist police. So they rioted. They kicked the police out of the center of Birmingham. They burned all the white bus businesses in, in Birmingham. And, and that same week, Birmingham desegregated. And, and a month later, um, the government was, uh, was supporting the Civil Rights Act that it had been saying that it, it couldn't support. Uh, they don't mention that in, in uh, the you know, history, history um, textbooks. If you, you know, go into a public school in the U.S. and you read about Birmingham, you'll think that, the, uh, you know, that it was a nonviolent campaign. Uh, and that's what won the day. So they're they're actively falsifying these histories um, so that we're always starting at a disadvantage without a sense of history, without a sense of tactics that actually work. So in a way, what, what you're saying is that even like, let's, let's call it the progressive left, um, uh, supporting nonviolence and being very clear that they, they would only support nonviolence, in a way, it's, it's them saying, we know you're a bit, we, we're more privileged than you and we're ready to give you 10% more privilege, but we're not ready actually to give you equality, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the progressive left, I think, uh, is, has been the more effective part in destroying these movements. Uh, in in the, the uprisings that started in Ferguson in 2014 and the current uprising starting in, in Minneapolis, uh, the police and the military have been unable to shut those uprisings down. And I mean, they've they've killed uh, more than a dozen people uh, in the streets. Military, police and white vigilantes have killed more than a dozen people, uh, protesters who are, you know, who've been reacting to police racism. And, and despite that level of violence and also police have been encouraging, uh, encouraging gang wars. They've been encouraging uh, racism and, and, and murder at, you know, any, any level that they can. And despite those levels of violence, people are still in the streets. Um, what's more effective is when the movement gets turned against itself. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to, to, you know, go up against, you know, rubber bullets, people getting their eyes shot out, tear gas, batons and all the rest. But if at the end of the day, despite all that violence from police, 
you're you're with other people who are supporting you and you're meeting new people in the streets who are supporting you that's a very empowering experience and and you can you can find the experience to you can find the um, the strength and the courage to go on but if you put yourself in that same situation of danger and then all of a sudden another protester grabs you hits you and hands you over to the police uh that's that's doing damage at a much deeper level uh, and that's that was historically also the most effective part of FBI's COINTEL program, the way that they could get a movement to to turn against itself. They often did that by spreading rumors um, that that legitimate activists were uh, were snitches. And today, uh, you know, the people do a similar thing on social media, claiming that, you know, those who are destroying stores or looting are are outside agitators or infiltrators. Uh, and and all the rest, and that's that's a um, that's a lie. That's a, a story that has been uh, especially spread by the progressive wing of the Democratic Party by people who who are participating in these movements. Yeah, I, w- I want to actually focus on this a little bit more, like this um, sort of the property destruction. Many people, I mean, around me, friends and stuff. And because of the media, obviously, because the media will focus on this, so most people will watch the, whatever ten o'clock news, and then we'll we'll talk about that. What do you make of property destruction? Um, and I know that f- personally, when people say you know like riots and uprising, like you should think about the pros and cons about what you're doing, etc., they probably forget that uprising are just that, right? Uprising. It's not something you 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 plan, right? It's the anger reaches a level that you just cannot sort of remain silent anymore. And it manifests itself sometimes by breaking stuff. Because I think, I'm sorry, because it's, it's, um, it's actually a way, I mean, breaking a store, like a young black man, a young white man, is also breaking society, right? breaking capitalism, breaking what has made you as poor and as desperate as you are. What do you think about that? Um, let me just get direct for a moment. If, if, if you know, speaking to everyone who might be watching this, if you are, you know, tuning in to a protest after uh, police have just murdered a black person, and you spend time worrying or about how how some of these folks are smashing a store or or taking TVs out of a store, you are a racist. It's, it's very, very clear. You, on the one hand, we have uh, more than a thousand people, disproportionately people of color, murdered by police. And on the other hand, we have broken glass and stolen clothes or stolen television. If, if you even just dedicate a minute to talk about, you know, oh, what a tragedy that, you know, this glass is getting broken, you know, these televisions are getting stolen, you are putting inanimate property uh, in, in a more important place or even in, on an equivalent plane as all of these murdered uh, black and other racialized people. That is a racist position. Um, it's, so it's just, yeah, uh, I think we just should not have tolerance for, for those kind of moral equivalences. Uh, getting more specific, uh, looting is great. Uh, looting is wealth redistribution. I mean, people talk about, you know, getting rid of capitalism. How do they expect that that's going to happen? Like we're going to form a committee and, you know, very, very calmly and rationally, you know, distribute all the wealth that might happen at one point, but that's not going to happen as long as police still exist. Uh, I mean, look, look at the statistics for, for how much, how much wealth gets stolen just from wages that bosses don't pay that they're legally obliged to pay. Uh, everyone who lives in this society who has ever worked a, a wage job has absolute validity to smash open a store window and take some of that wealth uh, and share it around. That's, uh, I don't know, and anyone who, who doesn't see that is, is basically coming, coming down strongly on the side of, uh, of people who steal from us, of corporations and, and governments and entities who legally steal from us uh, every day. And, and that just seems like a very miserable bootlicking position to take. Yeah, th- thanks for that. And I think it's a, it's actually a shame that because I think mo- most most sensible people will understand your point. But I mean, the mainstream corporate media is, is doing such a good job at focusing on these, you know, ten broken windows, that yeah. unfortunately, um, sort of the, the brainwashing works. But it's so crucial to understand what you've just said because it's when you say it the way you've said it, 
it makes so much sense, right? Um, finally, I want to talk about, you, you've spoken about, you know, we've spoken about violence, non-violence, uh, but I guess the whole question is about diversity of struggle, right? Um, I've, I've been to South Africa a few times. I've met lots of former, uh, or still, you know, anti-apartheid activists. And no one would tell you, I mean, some of them engage in peaceful struggle. Some of them engage in the boycott movement. Some of them engage in, in violence, in, you know, bombing uh, police stations and stuff. And they would all say, pretty much, all these elements contributed to the fall of ap apartheid, even though we know that social apartheid still obviously exists in South Africa. But actually, you know, all, all these aspects of the struggle contributed to the movement. And even the non-violent struggle people will say, I mean, luck, lucky we had people with guns and, 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 and you know, whatever, uh, shotgun on our side. So, yeah, just a thought about the diversity of struggle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, South Africa is also an interesting example. It, it's really funny how, especially during the, the 80s, um, uh, white, white pacifists really, really embraced Nelson Mandela. You know, he was on their, he was on their list together with Martin Luther King and, and Gandhi, um, with no apparent irony, you know, given how Gandhi supported uh, racist wars in South Africa. Um, but uh, and then when, when his autobiography came out and, you know, they realized actually Nelson Mandela helped organize armed groups. Um, it, it's, it's kind of funny, like, you know, the way and then, you know, it makes I think it makes completely complete sense from from his perspective. But the way that Nelson Mandela and others in the, the anti-apartheid movement, you know, they sort of had to play um, along with this this vision of nonviolence in order to get support from these white white progressives. So it's kind of a way of recognizing that nonviolence in, uh, you know, at least in that case, in many other cases, it's just kind of like a neurosis or just like a complex that, you know, these these fragile white progressives have. Um, and, and, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely correct. Like all of the different, uh, methods need to come together for an effective struggle. Uh, there's, there's lots of different, different things that need to happen. And we're seeing that, um, also in Minneapolis and other cities, um, like you mentioned, you know, the media focusing on these, these 10 broken windows, fortunately it's been a lot more than 10 broken windows, but yeah, they, they, they focus on, you know, the burning police station on the, the burning stores and all that. And that goes hand in hand with the fact that at the same time, people have been adapting these mutual aid anarchistic responses to the, uh, to the COVID pandemic. And so they're, they're also, you know, uh, putting up these mutual aid centers in, in all these different cities where people can get water and food and medical attention. And that goes hand in hand with, with making a stronger movement. So someone who, who personally, you know, they, they look at their own situation, they look in their heart, they personally don't want to fight with police. That's absolutely okay. There's a place for them in the movement, as long as they don't go snitching on people, as long as they don't go putting inanimate property uh, before the the lives of of actual human beings, uh, they can they can do peaceful things. They can focus on healing. Don't heal the cops. Don't heal the journalists. You know, heal the rioters. Help help out those people. You know, give us all collectively more strength because we'll be stronger together. Uh, so you know, I mean, like a healthy struggle. It's an ecosystem, and and there's there's um, there's a place for everybody except those who uh, who who are trying to destroy that relationship of solidarity, who are trying to not allow that diversity to flourish. Actually, one last thing I wanted to, to talk about uh, about people condemning the, the destruction of property. It's also actually um, putting the spot, you know, avoiding to put the spot the spotlight of where the real violence is coming from, right? I mean, if, if COVID-19 has done one thing is expose how corrupt, how broken the, the, the system was, neoliberalism was, um, how actually the, the bourgeois class is actually, uh, like a friend of mine, Vijay Prashad said, boycotting, boycotting humanity by, you know, sort of tax evasion, etc. So that's, that's a real violence, right? The economic violence is much more, you know, kills much more people than whatever, you know, bro broken windows and, and police station on fire, right? And we can end on this if you want. I mean, you can sure. respond, obviously, but yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I would actually respond by saying that it's a little bit dangerous to characterize neoliberalism as, as corrupt or broken, because I think it's, it's more uh, accurate and useful to say that it's, it's working very well, exactly as it was designed 
to work. Yeah, of course. And, and one of the things, so in most Western European uh, governments have, have opted for, um, you know, a strategy of social control that emphasizes social welfare, bureaucratically integrating people, making people more um, dependent on the state. But the U.S. as a settler state has a, a much higher proportion of, of necropolitics in, in its social control strategies, uh, which is a form of state intervention that, that generates crises and that lets people die. Um, so, so, I mean, there have been numerous capitalists and politicians who have gone on record saying that, that COVID will be a good thing because it will kill off a lot of old people, reducing, uh, you know, the so-called like burden on, um, on like welfare and, and social security systems. And that shows how they think. Um, capitalists are, are, are sociopaths. They actually have calculations that show the, the dollar or euro value of every single person. And that changes over age, an older person has a lower dollar value because they're they're not going to be able to work as much. They're going to be drawing more on these on these uh, social care systems, and so neoliberalism was actually designed to murder to kill off these people. Um, so so it's 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 working well. But I agree absolutely with with what you say that that the pandemic illustrated how this system uh, kills people. The 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 rebellions against police. Have also illustrated how uh, you know how this system. It's not bad apples. It's designed to kill poor people, to kill racialized people, and and we need to fight back. It's a question of basic decency, basic dignity, and a question of of survival. So I hope people continue to fight back and don't don't fall for uh, for easy answers or or cheap solutions. Thanks a lot, Peter. That was a uh, very instructive. Thanks a lot for having me, Frank.